Well, thank you all for joining us for a What's Cooking with Dr. Cook. Very excited um, for today's show because we have one of our wonderful foodguides.com contributors with us today, Caitlin Riley. Hi. Yay! So um, we are making one of Caitlin's recipes today, which is the no-bake granola bars. So psyched about this. And really today has been a day of Caitlin because you have your summer corn chowder on the site, which awesome. is today, as well as on our um, Instagram at Food Guides Help. You have the oatmeal blueberry bread. So it is just recipe day for from <laughs> Caitlin. So very, very cool stuff. Yeah. So thank you for joining us today. I'm psyched. This is so fun. I'm happy to be here. Very cool. Well, before we get into all of the cooking stuff, it's always great to have another registered dietitian on the site. So would love to hear a little bit about your background in nutrition. You know, where'd you start and where are you at now? Sure. I feel like I had a little bit of a winding road to get here. Um, I was a career changer. So I started in marketing and advertising and did that. I worked in an ad agency for a couple of years and just kind of wasn't feeling it after a couple of years, like really was always very interested in di in nutrition and dietetics and just kind of, I think my main like motivator to really go back to school and, and do this for real was when one of my cousins was diagnosed with type one diabetes at like two years old. And I just saw, like, I would talk to my aunt a lot about just how concerned she was for him and not really knowing how to manage his insulin and what to feed him and all of that kind of wrapped up together was just a good kind of kick in the right direction to go back and do this for real. So I went back to school um, to Simmons College in Boston, where I actually did my undergrad as well. And then I just was in a totally different building to, to get my RD. And then I did the internship with you, Allison. <laughs> oh. and that was like so exciting, so fun so stressful to get there <laughs> for those who don't know how the world of dietetics works you have to apply for an internship and then be matched to a program and i'm not sure what the acceptance rate is these days but it was like low 50s high 40s when i applied um so it was stressful <laughs> to get matched but then when i got matched and everything kind of worked out i was able to learn you know a little bit of everything clinical work community work um kind of private practice counseling type experience. And that's kind of where I am now. I've worked in mostly the wellness industry for the most part, um, really kind of doing preventative healthcare and working with clients and companies to provide educational tools really for just how to keep um, their clients or themselves healthy before it gets to the point of really needing intervention. Um, and I love that. I've really enjoyed doing kind of more of the wellness work. Um, but my biggest thing that I've enjoyed doing the last couple of years is really working with families and kids. Um, I have three kids myself. My son is n almost nine. He'll be nine at the end of the month. And I have twin girls who are four. Um, and they're kids. Like some days they eat well, some days they don't. Some days they're like, this is the worst thing. How dare you serve this to me? <laughs> And then other days, they eat a little bit of everything. So kind of trying to take away the pressure from parents that like you have to have the Pinterest perfect meal on the table every night and letting them know that, you know, if food is food. It's not about clean eating or bad eating or good food or bad food. That's kind of my focus now is to just try and help families kind of realize that Food is food, and we need kids to enjoy eating and feel safe in their eating environment and just kind of, you know, having healthy food, but knowing that all food has a purpose and just kind of focusing there. Yeah. And I love that because you actually wrote a series on yeah. foodguides.com about tips for families who are having frustrations feeding their children. And they're definitely not alone. I mean, 
especially, I mean, I'll just forewarn you when kids get into their adolescent years. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, every, they just, they just want the McDonald's, right. you know, there's, there is a feeling of, am I doing the right thing as a parent, you yeah. know, Absolutely. but that's what you have really focused on with your career. And, you know, I would love to take a minute if, if you would like to um, hear you kind of just, you know, speak about some of those tips that you would give parents if they are having those frustrations, um, you know, with feeding their kids, you know, Absolutely. that would be great. I feel like I'm coming from two sides of the coin here because I have the, the dietetics knowledge on it. And then I also have some picky eaters myself. So part of it, I think, is, you know, kids like like anybody, I think kids like to have a little bit of control in the situation. And parents are tired and busy and do, running in a million directions and making meals and going to practice and working and going to school and all of these things. So when you finally get to dinner time, everyone's stressed. Like it's not this calm environment necessarily where everybody's just sitting at the table, chit chatting, eating the food that you prepared. And part of that I think is parents taking some of the responsibility off of themselves about what it is that the kids have to eat. Um, it's kind of a division of responsibility is the, the whole theory behind this way of feeding your children, that it's the parent's job to buy the food, prepare the food, and set the stage for where and when you're going to eat. So if you really are a firm believer in like no eating in front of the TV, then it's your your rule, your role to set that stage and say like, okay, we serve meals at the table in this house. You know, you can sit at the kitchen counter, you can sit at the kitchen table, but like we're not having snacks all over the house. But then it's up to the kids to decide what they're going to eat. And that can get stressful for everybody. But I think the more you have that as your your kind of family rule around food, then the kids get a lot of autonomy and a lot of confidence in saying things like, I'm not ready to try that yet. Or like, I don't want to have a bite of that today. And as frustrating as you might be like, just eat the chicken, like, please just have a bite of chicken nugget or whatever it is that you made. If all they decide to eat is the carrot sticks and the strawberries and drink a glass of milk, then that's their call. And like the older they get, I think it's a little easier to explain to them that like, you know, I feel like I say 13 times a day, your belly might still be hungry if you don't eat any more than that, you know, but giving them the, the, not necessarily the freedom, but the responsibility to choose what goes into their body goes a long way, I think, down the road. Um, and it helps with, you know, my son is nine and he's probably my most like selective eater. And I don't like to say picky eater because when he was probably four or five years old, I overheard him talking about himself and called himself a picky eater. And he sounded so defeated and so crushed, like he did something wrong. Um, and it just really kind of changed my whole approach to introducing new foods, keeping the variety coming, cooking things in different ways, but always making sure that there was a safe option for him because he's the kind of kid who, he's not like, I mean, you might hear, older generations be like, well, if you just put the food on the plate, if they're hungry enough, they'll eat it. Like, you know, <laughs> he's the kid right. who like starve himself. He really won't. If he's too nervous about the situation, he won't eat the food. So I know that's kind of a long winded response, but my, like the biggest tips that I usually give to parents are to have like provide access to food on a regular basis. So build yourself a schedule that works for your family. So if it's breakfast at 7 a.m. and then they if they're school aged kids and they go off to school, they probably have a snack at school and then lunch. And then when they get home, another snack and then dinner. So that there isn't an option, there isn't really an opportunity for them to get hangry, <laughs> really, like all of us have. But so that they, you know, when they're ha when they're sitting at the table and they're faced with a plate of food that they've never really eaten before, it doesn't have to be coming from a place of fear where they're so hungry that then it's just a meltdown of, 
I don't want to eat this, but I'm so hungry and I don't know what to do. And it's heartbreaking to see them like that. So I try to recommend to people, you know, like every meal should have a safe food or one or two safe foods for the kids. And it's fine to, to incorporate new things and you want to teach them to enjoy the food that you like to eat and that you like to cook for your family. But I think the most important thing is making sure that they enjoy food and feel comfortable eating food. Um, and then I try to, to remind people that, you know, stages definitely happen and some kids are more selective when they're younger and they totally grow out of it. But keeping the pressure off of the situation is, I think, the most helpful thing for kids. And if they're just like, no, I'm not going to eat that, like, don't take it personally. <laughs> don't be like, I made that for you. How dare you not like it? You know, it's really just about kind of keeping everybody feeling calm and feeling safe with their food choices. Definitely. I love that. In private practice, are you still seeing a lot of the clean plate club mindset? Yeah, definitely. Or at least like, maybe not so much clean plate, but like the, the new phrase is like the polite bite, where the rule in the household would oh. be like, you have to take at least one bite of everything on your plate, because otherwise it could be seen as rude to not do that. If you're eating at a grandparent's house or a friend's house, it's like they're required to take the polite bite. But I feel like that gets kids in the mindset of like, this food is gross and I have to take a bite of it because they're making me, not because they're actually interested in the taste or the flavor or the texture or just enjoying the meal. And I get it. It's hard because if you have a child who like never wants to eat anything, how do you break through that barrier? And, you know, there are definitely instances where getting your pediatrician involved is the right way or getting, you know, it because it could be an occupational therapy issue. It could be a sensory issue. But a lot of times it's just a pressure issue or it's a kid who just wants to be in control of their own food choices. So I think, you know, the, the clean plate club, I don't see quite as much anymore. Um, but definitely the try a bite, try a bite, try a bite. But if you're constantly told that this, the pressure is still there, the clean plate pressure and the polite bite pressure. So in that case, I usually still tell my own kids like, you know, you can say no, thank you and leave it at that. And you don't have to, you don't have to try anything that you're not ready to try. Um, it gets harder sometimes when they're just then like, okay, well, I'm never eating chicken or I'm never eating fish. But I found in my own experience of having a pretty selective eater that with enough kind of support around him and know it, him knowing that like my, my interpretation is not going to change. I'm not going to pressure you to take a bite when you're not ready. So when you are ready to do it, it'll be your choice. And he, like, I mean, when he was probably four or five years old, 20 foods, maybe he ate 25 foods. And now, I mean, tons and like, I wouldn't say he's comfortable eating everything, but he's so much more confident in making the choices himself, which feels still like we have a long way to go in terms of him being willing to be like a foodie and try everything. But I'm so much happier knowing that he feels like it's his choice, it's his stomach, it's his everything. Um, and it just makes me feel like, okay, this is, we're on the right path here. There's still a lot more food to introduce into his world, but we're on the right path of him having the, the proper mindset about food. When you create a plate for him, chicken, for example, are you preparing what would be like a normal portion or are you putting say just like a, a smaller portion because you know that he's not into it, but you know, or are you putting like a normal portion because that might be the day right. that he's gonna, you know, that he's going <laughs> to, yep. he's going to try it and decide potentially that that is one of his new foods. Yeah. That's a super good question. Cause I feel like a lot of people deal with that a lot of like, on twofold because a lot of people will um family style eating is stressful to to people like just having bowls of food on the table and letting the kids serve themselves 
because it feels like a huge waste of food potentially, um, or just a bigger mess that you have to clean up, more bowls to put out, all of that. But family style eating can be very helpful to the kids because then they get the, again, the autonomy to decide, I want a pound of strawberries and a half a carrot <laughs> and they kind yeah. of make their own plate. So what I've been doing, especially when introducing a newer food, I have like all the to like food toys, like the little food picks or the cookie cutters that are in different shapes. And I'll cut him like a one bite size. And I do this for my, for my girls too. Um, and just give them like a one bite with the food pick or one bite in a fun shape of a little cookie cutter or something and put that on their plate. And then I also have like a family style set up for them. So if he decides, yeah, that chicken was actually pretty good tonight. I liked the sauce or I liked how you cooked it or whatever, then he can help himself to more if he decides to try it. Some nights he's all about it. If he's played five baseball games that day, he'll do it. Um, <clears throat> and then other nights he's just kind of like, I'm not feeling it today. And I definitely get that pit in my stomach of that flip, like my stomach flips like, no, please just have a bite. But trying to just give him the space to say, no, I don't want that tonight. Like, I get it. Some nights I'm not in the mood for certain food. I mean, I feel like as a we forget that sometimes that, yes, there are kids and we're trying to teach them, you know, how to live in the world or whatever. But like they're allowed to have their own feelings on food or their own opinions on I didn't really want pasta tonight. So I'm just going to stick with the fruit and the veggie or, you know, bread and butter and a glass of milk or something, you know, and. It's not always what we want to have happen, but it's not it's not a bad outcome to have them be able to say, make choices that they feel good about. I think it's the right message to send them, um, especially with I feel like the intuitive eating is kind of a new food trend of like teaching people that, you know, are trying to eliminate a little bit more of the diet culture and eliminate focusing on a certain diet type, not, not a medical diet, but just like a fad diet. Um, and I think kind of kids don't learn to override that intuitive, those intuitive eating cues until they're about Finn's age, like nine, 10 years old is when they really start to kind of override those cues because, you know, chips taste better than broccoli or, you know, my friends have this kind of chicken. So why don't we, why aren't we eating that kind? Um, so I think the younger you can teach them to trust their own actual gut about what they're going to be eating, like the better they'll do with those decisions later. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Just the idea of knowing fullness, you know, satiety and, you know, hunger cues is so important as well. You know, cause yeah. that's, that's really not something that, you even think about as a kid, obviously, um, uh, unless you're experiencing food insecurity, of course. Uh, yes. But um, you know, it's it's just not talked about in right. in school. I mean, really, you don't learn a lot about nutrition unless no. you are in high school and you get your first food and nutrition course, which is still an elective in most states yeah. so I was yeah. gonna say, I think we I mean we're in Massachusetts and it's I don't know I mean granted I'm not my kids aren't in the out the older schools yet but I don't know that it's even like home ec is not something that happens regularly anymore or like an intro to food and nutrition it's like maybe one chapter of a health class um mm -hmm. I would love it if like food and nutrition came into the schools in a more realistic way. I mean, kids, like we should be teaching kids to learn how to, learn how to do all the things that we almost expect from them too. Like, you know, at a certain age, we're kind of like, you know, cut up your own apple, but if they've never learned how to do it, where, you know, if you're not doing that at home, where would they learn how to do it? Well, exactly. And when I was teaching in the high school, there were there were a few classes where I had more than a handful of kids who had never cooked an egg before. They ate eggs, but they had never cooked an egg before. Oh. And they're heading off to, you know, college or live in the real world in a few years. And several of them who had never cut their own food before, um, which again, you know, knife skills are, are a real thing and should be 
utilized in the home. Um, uh, it's it's a very important thing to let your kids cut cut their own food. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it seems like like a like a silly thing to people, or like they would be like, oh, "It's it." I usually find it when I'm talking to families that it's a time saver for the parents to just do everything themselves, and they feel like we have so much going on. We have to, you know, it's already six o'clock. Dinner needs everybody needs to eat. We need to take a bath. We need to do this. We need to do that. Somebody has practice. Somebody has a game. So for them to just do it all themselves is a time saver for them. So that's really, that's hard too. And one kind of tip I guess I would have for people who feel like that's their experience is to maybe like create the plate for the child or have, you know, I will a lot of times give my girls a cutting board and a little knife for them to cut their food as they're eating. So I'll make a little, I'll help them serve themselves their food or I'll make a plate for them and then have the family style food in front of them. But then if it's something like cucumbers or strawberries or um, even broccoli, carrot sticks, something like that, I'll serve them a few and then give them larger portions that they then can cut themselves. And it kind of keeps everybody seated for longer for dinner. <laughs> and yeah. it also, again, it gives them like when, it's really is true that when you get kids in the kitchen cooking, helping you, they're so much more willing to try the food that they've touched. Oh, yes, absolutely. And this is one of those recipes yeah. that we're making tonight that everybody can do. Yeah. And kids especially, oh my gosh, like hands down. Because first of all, what what a money saver. Yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, how many, boxes of, how many boxes of granola bars have you bought in your life? <laughs> oh my gosh. So many. Yes. <laughs> yes. So totally excited to do this because yeah. it is so quick, <laughs> so good, but also the economics of this are insane because, yeah, I mean, I love, I love granola bars. Who doesn't love granola bars? Right. Um, and kind of like we talked about the, I like the chewy, you like the chewy. Yes. Um, I am not exactly sure if is there anybody down there who actually loves the crunchy ones? The, I mean, but yay if you do. Um, but these are the chewy ones. And um, hey, 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 woo. Um, so easy to make. I mean, I think it, it might be impossible to actually mess these up. It is. I'm going to say that now. If for some reason <laughs> you start to mess them up in bar form, just roll them into little balls. And then they're like the oh. real trendy oat bites. <laughs> Yes. Awesome. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. That, that is awesome. Cause I, um, I'm going to actually put some, some fillings in, I think for mine, um, yeah. today. So yeah, I'm excited to get to this, to, to show everybody. Cause it's, it's so, it's just so easy and so quick. So let's do it. Awesome. I'm ready. Yeah. All right. All right. We're going to get cooking everybody. So, okay take take it over here and um and then so first things first is you have taught me through, <laughs> through this recipe the the parchment paper trick oh it's the best okay do you want to do it you can have the honors allison all right so I did not know this before. Um, <laughs> and then I was I was looking over this recipe and apparently if you take parchment paper and crinkle it up, which I will do, it's actually, you know, lays <laughs> lays down in the pan yeah. Yeah. Um, without folding up. So wow. <laughs> <laughs> and that works on cookie sheets and everything. Because what I would do is I would take a baking sheet and just lay down the parchment paper. It would roll up on the ends. And then whatever I was cooking, I would put just whatever was there, like four on each end. I had no idea that you could just crinkle it up and it would go. So I'm going to do that right now. I know. It's such a 
for the noise. So yeah, so normally you'd put this in and I mean, it's just not laying, so. Right. Now I'm gonna crinkle it. I also realized I don't have many eight by eight pans, so this one's actually eight by eight by five. So. <laughs> Y'all look at that. Yeah. Look at that. that is super cool. So we will set this aside. Perfect. Yeah, it just fits. Look at that. Yeah, it's it's so just makes life easier. You don't need it's to get hack. mad at people while you're cooking. <laughs> Exactly. I did not know. Yeah. All right. Okay. Should I also turn to ingredients and what we're doing here? Can you see my stuff? Kind of. Maybe. <laughs> I can. <laughs> yes, I can. Cool. <laughs> so um, just for everyone, we have ingredients we have the gluten-free quick cook cooking oats um cinnamon salt no salt added creamy peanut butter natural peanut butter pure maple syrup vanilla and chocolate chips is the base ingredients or are the base ingredients for this recipe so that is what we're we're starting with and like you said, I think you mentioned you might throw some other stuff in yours. And yes. these are so customizable. Um, usually if I make, when I first kind of created this recipe, I would throw a lot more nuts in. Like I would chop up walnuts or um, slivered almonds and things just to the healthy fat and the protein content a little bit. But I found that with kids, they didn't love the nuts quite as much. Um, and I usually make these to send to sports practices and things like that. So I wanted to keep it kind of simple, but you can absolutely add other nuts, dried fruit, all kinds of good stuff. Okay. Yeah, I actually, I think I'm going to add chopped macadamia nuts because I was in the mood and some wow. coconut for, for this particular batch. So tasty. So, so I'm going to throw my oats in first. Me too. So it's one and three quarter cups of oats. And the quick cooking oats, I mean, regular oats will work as well, but the quick cooking absorbs the peanut butter and maple syrup mixture so much faster. Um, and then it really helps with that chewy, chewiness of the bars when they're done. Perfect. I just love Bob's Red Mill everything. So that's a good product. Definitely. So next is, so these are the dry ingredients first. So the oats, the cinnamon, and the salt. So yes. next is one and a half teaspoons of cinnamon. Yep. And if you're sensitive to cinnamon, if you don't like it as much, you can leave it out. You can add more. Whatever works for you the best, you can do. Cinnamon is becoming one of those like superfoods that you hear a lot about too. So, so I like good. It. I like it personally. Also, I have to flex these um, measuring spoons. I don't even know where I got them, but they're so cool because they all like just click together so you don't lose yeah. them. Like how cool is that? Awesome. All right, and then there is a half a teaspoon of salt. Yeah. Yeah, and if somebody likes like a flaked Maldon sea salt or something, you could leave the salt out of the recipe and then put like Maldon salt on top or um, like any other flaked sea salt, especially with like a dark chocolate combo would be really yummy. Um, so if you didn't want to add salt to the recipe because you were throwing some salt on top, you could do that as well. Okay. All right. And then we just kind of like mix this together. Yeah, just kind of mix it all in. Um, I definitely like to use the stand mixer once you add in the wet ingredients, just because it's oh, yeah. a little thicker. But for this part, just mix it up. Okay. Smells good. 
Yeah. Cool. So for the next part, we have peanut butter, peanut butter and maple syrup in a microwavable container. Yeah. So I kind of measured out my cup of peanut butter. I use uh, Trader Joe's brand, no salt, creamy peanut butter. Again, same reason with the salt. I'd go with the non-salted peanut butter just so you can control the amount of salt in your granola bar. And I wouldn't use a crunchy peanut butter here because it would kind of, I think, make the bars a little bit more crumbly. Um, but the creamy peanut butter, all natural peanut butter works great. Come up with the uh, GIF, the low nice. sodium GIF. Perfect. And then maple syrup, I usually just pour the half a cup right on top of the peanut butter and then stick it in the microwave for probably 30 seconds or so. So I'm going to walk away and do that real quick. Cool. Still getting my peanut butter out. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is All where right. the mic is key when you mix them together because it makes it much easier to stir. Um, so once you get your peanut butter measured and your maple syrup measured, Nuke it for a couple seconds, 30 seconds or so, and then it will mix much more easily. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's so mm -hmm. sticky. But it smells so good. I actually, I haven't messed with peanut butter in a long time. I feel like I <laughs> ate so much of it. Like back in the day when I was yeah. doing the protein shakes, when I was weightlifting and <laughs> now I've made these and I was like, oh, I remember how good peanut butter was. Right? We yeah. eat so much peanut butter in our house. Between peanut butter and Greek yogurt, I feel like that could be <laughs> an entire food budget. <laughs> like we yep. Eat <laughs> All right, half a cup of maple syrup. Okay. Um, I saw this maple syrup and I was so excited because it's from Vermont. Yeah. The and real yes. Right. The real deal. <laughs> it's like, I love Vermont maple syrup. It is just mm -mm -mm. same. All right. <laughs> my microwavable container is this like soup container I think I got it from the uh dollar tree or something but it comes in handy I yeah I'm a soup person me too of all kinds and it has a vent on top oh yeah all right so I am going to move you all over to my stand mixer because this right. is where the fun begins. <laughs> so this will go in for 30 seconds. Yes? Yeah, probably about 30 seconds. Okay. All right. And then we have just two more main ingredients. So the half a teaspoon of vanilla. Yeah, and mix that in after you've heated. Okay. Um, you don't want to like you don't want to heat the vanilla up in the microwave. Um, okay. So we put it in after you've anybody who's making along or doing it later. You want to add the vanilla after you've mixed the peanut butter and maple syrup. I should probably wait. <laughs> it looks interesting, but it yeah, smells so, amazing. Right? When you first kind of mix it together, it looks like it's separating, but then if you just kind of keep mixing it, it comes together like a nice smooth, like, let me show you. Kind of looks like, like a Ooh. peanut butter topping. Oh. <laughs> I just dumped it in. That's all right. That works too. <laughs> Let the mixer do the work. 
Yes. So I'm going to dump mine in as well. Alrighty. There we go. I like the paddle attachment to mix them because the whisk, it gets a little bit stuck in there, but the paddle works really well. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So vanilla now? Yeah. Go ahead and put the vanilla in like right on top of the peanut butter. Vanilla Perfect. in. Okay. And that's another one that if you like the flavor of vanilla, you can add more. If you don't like it as much, you can leave it out. But I think it adds a little something to it once it's all combined. Cool. All right. Now it is time to mix. And now we mix, yeah. And it's like not even a minute, super quick. This is on low. Yep, I have mine on like a two or a four. And if you okay. feel it, if it seems like the oats aren't mixing, boost it up a little bit. And then um, you can scrape down the sides and do it one more time before adding the chips. Okay. It looks good. Yeah. Hey, there we go. <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> Very cool. Love to have a stand mixer. It's like definitely, but I like make so much with it. I love it. Yeah, this this looks uh, pretty well mixed already. Because yeah. the the thing too is when you press it down into the pan, it's like making a sandcastle. Like it forms right to the pan. Right. So I'm gonna throw in my chocolate chips and do it one more time. All right, so it is three quarter of a cup of the chocolate chips. Yeah, and I'm a big fan of the mini chocolate chips. You have the minis because then they're not just like overwhelming like the chocolate, they just mix in really quickly. Um, do you suggest um, three quarters of a cup even if you're adding other items? I would maybe cut it back to a half a cup if okay. you're going to add like craisins or cherries or nuts or something like that. Um, okay. And if at the end of the day it's not chocolatey enough, you could melt a little chocolate to drizzle on top after you cut them. Okay. And should yeah. I add my nuts now too? Yeah. Yep. Add it okay. all in. And for anybody who is looking for this, so if you go with gluten free oats, it's totally free recipe. And it can also be um, dairy free if you, this is a good brand, the Enjoy Life brand chips. For anybody who needs it to be kind of more allergy friendly, the mini chips are great. And they make a whole bunch of different flavors too, I noticed. Yeah. Yep, I was actually at Target the other day and saw peanut butter ones and butterscotch ones. So I have to Ooh. think of what they make with those. I think I might mix in my coconut. Yeah, is what it shredded? Of that? It is shredded, yeah. Yeah. I would mixing it in is a good call. Cool. <laughs> All right. So this is chocolate chip macadamia nut coconut. Yum. All right, thank you. <laughs> Good choice. <laughs> so I should probably scrape down the side there. Yeah. And if it looks a little crumbly, it's Honestly, fine. Once you've kind of form it into your pan, it will come together. Yes. Woohoo.
Well, that, that looks like it's mixing very well. Perfect. I like the coconut idea. I'm going to have to make a batch with coconut. I thought about coconut and cherry. I think that would be really good too. Yeah. Um, but I didn't see my cherries. Oh, you know what? That is just... Everybody, make sure to lock your mixers when you're... Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, it was on low. <laughs> oh, wait. It, it was locked. No, it just still... It, it is a thick mixture for sure. <laughs> Ooh. All right. So once it's all together... You can just dump it into your pan that you're using. It's a little crumbly at first, but once you press it all together, it forms really easily. So mine looks a little crumbly. But I usually use my just my fingers at first, and then if you want to grab another piece of parchment paper. Okay, cool. Yeah. Press it down right on top. I'm using two eight by eight like baking tins because once I press it down with the parchment paper, just kind of smush it into every corner, flatten it as much as you can. And then I take another one and just put it on top. And press it. Oh, the coconut smells really good in here. I'm glad I did that. Good call. Okay, so grab some parchment and start smushing. Exactly. So what was your favorite nutrition course? I think in? I enjoyed my clinical course the most, which is because I never thought of myself as wanting to work as a clinical doctor, really in the hospital, but I think I learned most in that course because at clinical college where I did my degree, you would it was a right back one of the most wonderful Boston hospitals. It got to Beth Israel and Brigham and Women's and Children's Hospital and and do some counseling, and I think that that really was kind of the outpatient. You know, I wanted to do more like outpatient counseling. I really like spending more time with family. Definitely. During my internship, um, clinical was my favorite rotation, and I thought it was going to be my the least favorite. favorite. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was unreal because um, I got, I was super blessed to go to a level one trauma center that had wow. seven intensive care units. Oh, my gosh. Where were you? Uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan. Okay. And it was just amazing. It was a teaching hospital, too. So the dietitians there pretty much had like order writing privileges on every floor. The doctors would, you know, round the interns got to round like with all of the residents and everything wow. like that. It was so cool. And that's why my first job out of my internship was at a hospital as a um, RD in the ICUs as a the nutrition support RD. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I really like working with um, diabetic patients, and then I worked a lot on a cardiac unit, and I found that to be a really good experience. I got to talk to a lot more people about kind of preventative stuff, people that were there for their heart attack or. Um, using food in a healthy way and a preventative way is kind of what really got me engaged in that side of nutrition. 
Yeah. It, it's a little more of a connection to your clients being able to sit and actually counsel them about yeah. The, yeah, their disease processes. So this is super easy to mold. Yeah, it's like a sandcastle, what my kids say, because <laughs> you could really form it. That's why it's actually really great. You can use the same recipe if you wanted to make the little like energy bites and just roll them up into little circles. Um, you could do, oh, you yeah. wouldn't have to do anything about the recipe. Did you all already mold yours? I did. So I used the parchment paper and then I put okay. another eight by eight um, ah. dish up to kind of press it down and then it's all kind of formed like that perfect Same as yours. and then you can put it in the fridge or freezer for anywhere from two hours to overnight if necessary i wouldn't use an more than overnight uh, mostly because you'll probably want to eat them but just so that they don't get too hard and crumbly if you want to get Okay, did you say no more than overnight? Yeah. So I would, if you, you can do it up to overnight. Okay. More than overnight, because then they might just get a little bit crumbly when you cut them. <laughs> well, I did make a test batch yesterday. Same. By the power of television. Oh. Like. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it, it's, it may have been... <laughs> refrigerated a little little long <laughs> i'm sure it will be fine it'll cut up fine we're gonna test it let's take a look all right let's see all right we're gonna take it out okay first i'm gonna unveil it to everyone okay. <laughs> look at how beautiful that looks ah so this does not have coconut or nuts in it. It is just the chocolate chip. Okay. So, oh my gosh. And I'm just so excited right now <laughs> because <laughs> ah, it just came out. It just came yeah. out. Yes. Look All at right. that. I'm cutting mine too. Now, do you just take it off of your parchment paper? I actually just cut it right on the parchment paper on top of a cutting board, but you could take it off if you want to. That's that's smart. What um kind of knife do you prefer? I used a big chef's knife to cut it because okay. then you could just kind of rock and cut the whole way through the bars. Okay. But they are super easy to cut, so if you don't have a big chef's knife with you, that's fine too. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> right. And okay. I love they yes. Hold together. They hold their shape like a real granola bar. And they will once you like cu cut them up and wrap them either in parchment paper, tin foil, even if you just wanted to put them individually in um, a Ziploc bag or one of those like silicone reusable bags, they will stay good in the fridge for weeks if they last that long at your house. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think these will. I mean, I yeah. did try the, the batter because I had to. Um, and I'm always a fan of like the no-bake cookies. Yeah. But then I was like, no-bake granola bars? Are you serious? <laughs> um, and yeah, no, I'm, I don't think these will last, you know, a few days, to be honest. They're really good in the afternoon with a cup of tea. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. I'm like, I love to dip everything. Um, although these might not be dippable. I had that in mind. I was like, coffee and yeah. one of these. It's like a little energy boost. Yeah. They're really good. They're very kid friendly, too. I find that most kids, if they can eat peanut butter, like them. And sometimes if I'm making them for like my son to take to a game or something, I'll throw, I'll melt some chocolate and drizzle chocolate over the top just to make them look a little fancier for him. Oh, yeah. That's a great idea. I'm excited to see what you think. 
<laughs> I can't wait to taste them. <laughs> I actually know that I have a couple of teens home too. Oh, good. They'll get to snack on them. Yeah. One, two, three, four. I bet the coconut macadamia is going to be really tasty. I'm really excited about that. That's a good combo. These are these are thick too, because I yeah. know that the um, the recipe said 14, so I wanted to check yeah. and see if in fact it was 14. And yes, it is, and they're thick. Yeah, they're really filling. And actually, I'm going to grab something really quickly to show you that when I started making these all the time, I got for myself. Um, not that putting them in a cookie tin and cutting them is difficult by any means, but I found these silicone granola bar molds. Oh, cool. Which are also really great because then you just do the same thing that you did before with the parchment paper, but put them in individual bars and then they just pop out as well. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I tell you what, I think we should plate a couple of these. Okay. And then we need to try them, of course. Yeah, the prettiest ones. <laughs> Oh my gosh, so amazing. And they're big too. Like they're, they're huge. Yeah, they're you could definitely cut them in half. You could, like I said before, you could roll them into like the little energy bite size if you didn't want to have them as bars, or if you over measured your peanut butter or over measured the maple syrup, you could roll them a little bit more easily that way. Ta -da. You ready? I'm ready. Awesome. They look great. Yes, they look amazing. Oh, I can't wait to try them. We have to. We have to. Try a little them. chewy when you get in there. <laughs> so, what am I? Uh, actually, I'm going to grab another one because I'm gonna, <laughs> going to go deliver a couple to the oh, teens. Nice. So, I'm not exactly sure if they're watching or not. But. <laughs> I, I hope they like them. <laughs> I'm sure they will. I know they will. We'll wait for their response. So okay. we go up, go up into the dark cave of teen. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to make sure one of my kids is home and have them come be a taste tester. I kicked them out for tonight. Yeah. This could get really long if they're involved. <laughs> <laughs> I do the knock. Yep. It's time to taste test. <laughs> okay. Here they come. All right. So there's that. You give the other one. Mm -hmm. Then I need testimonials. <laughs> Honest opinions. Honest opinions. They kind of taste like the inside of an uncrushable. Ooh. Tastes like the inside of an okay, so you can hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I do like some vegetables. I think they're pretty good. They're very soft. <laughs> mm -hmm. I hear one of my kids. I might make him. <laughs> okay, we got some mm -mm -mm's too. Yeah, yeah pretty right. good. And right. um ums from teenagers. That's high it praise. It is high praise. My yeah, thank you. Superstar just showed up, so I'm gonna make him try one as well. Okay. <laughs> The granola bars. Oh, yeah. Loves these. Give an honest opinion. These are really, really good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, <so> awesome. <laughs> that is just the amount of chocolate chips, I feel like. He said just the right amount of chocolate chips, not too many. Oh, I love and that. Finn, Finn is a big fan of the mini chip. He thinks it's the, the best to add to muffins or bars, right? Because if they melt, it's literally all chocolate. And if they don't melt, it's too much chocolate and not enough peanut butter. So you need a mix. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yay. Okay, I'm going to try. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Like a mm -hmm. 
They're really good. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. Mm -hmm. right. I have another munchkin here. <laughs> the cinnamon, actually. Right. Pretty tasty. So the cinnamon, yeah, the cinnamon <laughs> takes it up a notch. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to hear what you think of the coconut and the macadamia nut. I'm going to have to do that combo too. I'm psyched about it for sure. And they're... The consistency is perfect. Um, yeah, I don't think I can buy granola bars ever again. I mean, honestly, <laughs> after making these. And they really do come together. We've got a little visitor saying hello. Hi. They're, they're super affordable. Like you can find all of these ingredients all the time. Mm -hmm. And right. you can make them in a batch of, I think you said four, we got 14 out of them. 14. So mm -hmm. that's more than you'd get in a box of Cliff bars that you probably pay eight bucks a box for. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. That's great. <laughs> awesome. Yay. Well, this is fantastic. Awesome. Yay. I'm so well, glad we did this. This was fun. Definitely. I w actually like, so your summer corn chowder yeah. is on the site right now. I want to make that. I it's really want to make that really good. It's light and kind of just not as thick and heavy as like a traditional clam chowder or like more of a potato soup. It's super like kid friendly. If your kids, there's not a ton of like spice in it. You could add spice to it, but it's, um, it's really tasty. Yeah. It looks amazing. That was another one. I was just reading it. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I, I have to have this. <laughs> like, I, I have to, cause I yeah. love corn chowder, but it, it, it's not as heavy like you said it's, it's yeah. lighter so I everybody wants to check that out it's it's on foodguides.com right now today yeah. let us know if you like it because it's one of our one of our faves around here with mm -hmm. avocado toast on the side <laughs> oh gosh mm -mm. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. definitely one of my favorites <laughs> well cool well hey everybody thank you so much for hanging out and you know chilling with us as we were making these granola bars and you know it's it's been very fun today these are amazing so please make them yourselves make them with your kids make them with your family they're easy so and you can add lots of things i will um i'll post a picture when these uh granola bars with the macadamia nuts and the coconut are settled perfect so, I'll probably leave them in the fridge overnight, but yeah. And that will be at Food Guides Help on our socials. So check us out. Awesome. Yeah. Thank and you thank so you. Much, this was fun. Yeah. Th thank you, Caitlin. And thank you to everybody in the audience. And we will see you here next Wednesday. Sounds good. Wonderful. All right. Well, bye, bye everybody. Thank you.